Pinellas County's Heritage Village. It's a step back into the past with 28 restored buildings that reflect more than 100 years of local history. Here's the Sulphur Springs Railway Depot. A structure like this was perhaps the first sight visitors saw when they stepped off the train from northern cities. Town folk gather together in a building like this one, the Safety Harbor Church, to give thanks for ample food and good health, essential ingredients to the pioneer existence. But of all the structures in Heritage Village, people seem to find this one the most nostalgic. We were in front of the old mercantile store, which was a functioning grocery store and butcher shop in 1915 in St. Petersburg. Now it's here at Heritage Village, and the shelves are filled with memories of another time. Let's go inside. I can remember my family having many of these same products in our kitchen when I was a small child growing up. And Coca-Cola from this kind of soda bottle tasted every bit as refreshing as the soft drink does today. We can all have fun strolling through the village, trying to imagine what life was like back in the old days. But there have been several guests that have come through here recently that can actually remember growing up in and around these historic structures. They are the ancestors of Pinellas County's founding pioneers. We've talked with some of them and we share some of those memories with you today. To start, let's go back to the very beginning, to a time when the old-fashioned log cabin was the pride of the local neighborhood. It's the oldest existing structure in Pinellas County, the McMullen Coachman Log Cabin. It was built in 1852 by Captain James McMullen, an original homesteader to Pinellas County, one of the seven McMullen brothers. Captain Jim and his wife, Elizabeth Campbell McMullen, raised 11 children in this cabin, which sat near the intersection of Northeast Coachman and Old Coachman Roads in Clearwater. During the Civil War, Elizabeth protected the family homestead and raised their children while James served with the Confederate Cow Cavalry. For nearly 20 years, this was the most substantial home in Upper Tampa Bay, and with Elizabeth's hospitality, it was a favorite stop for overland travelers to enjoy an evening of dancing to guitar, fiddle, and organ music. Around the turn of the century, the McMullen family sold this log cabin and surrounding lands to another pioneer family. Jesse and Solomon Smith Coachman, who served as the first chairman of the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners in 1912. We caught up with granddaughters Martha Coachman McBride and Ann Coachman Epling at the Country Jubilee Celebration in Heritage Village. While most people see the McMullen Coachman log cabin and marvel at its charm, the Coachman cousins relived old memories born through very young eyes. I used to just play. I lived with my grandmother too for two years, same, about the same time you did. Uh, and I used to play on this front porch, you know, bring my dolls up here and just play around. Yeah, I remember playing on the front porch too, running up and down those stairs that nobody can go up now. Now we used to we used to do that. I have brought my grandchildren. I have. I brought my grandchildren here too, and they just can't believe that their great great grandparents lived here. <laughs> no running water. No electricity, but people did. Jesse Coachman began selling jars of jellies and marmalades. Family members recalled that the president of the Seaboard Railroad sampled some of Jesse's wares one day, proclaimed them the world's finest, and began serving them in his railroad's dining cars. That agreement may have provided the impetus to create a railway line through the Coachman property and establish the Coachmans as leaders in the fruit packing and shipping business. Jesse Coachman decided to capitalize on the area's love of citrus. Down by the railroad tracks, near their main packing plant, the family built a replica of the old log cabin, called it the Kumquat Sweet Shop, and began to sell citrus confections. And she used to sell, oh, the most wonderful candies made out of citrus. Candied grapefruit peel was oh, my favorite. Mine too. <laughs> the kitchen was, was behind it, uh, the replica of the log cabin behind the sweet shop and as a child I would go down there and wait for my mother. I'd get off the bus at the, at the railroad crossing and I, my grandmother would be in the sweet shop selling her stuff and I would go over there and my cousins and I used to sneak back to uh, the kitchen behind the sweet shop where the cook whose name was Columbus was cooking jellies and marmalades and they would have the candied grapefruit peel laid out on wax paper on these tables and we would little hand would go up and we would sneak them until we were caught but that would that 
sweet shop was a replica of this cabin. Yeah. It was built just like this. Fond childhood memories, recalling a sweet treat in simpler times. All part of the history surrounding the oldest structure in Pinellas County. Now sharing its story at Pinellas County's Living History Museum, Heritage Village. From the mid-1800s to the turn of the century, the standard of living and housing in Pinellas County changed, as evidenced by this wonderful house of seven gables. Thirteen rooms now completely furnished with artifacts from that time period. This old house has served many purposes in its long history. A private home, a boarding house, even a parsonage. But here are the memories of someone whose family spent time on this very front porch and called this house their home. The House of Seven Gables has a long, rich history. Built in 1907, the beautiful Victorian-style structure originally sat atop a bluff overlooking Clearwater Harbor. And over the years, many memories were made between her walls. Recently, we were able to talk with Tom Chesnut, a descendant of a past resident. He shared some touching stories about the memorable home from another time. My uh, mother lived here in 1916. The, uh, her father was an Episcopal minister in Clearwater, Episcopal Church of the Ascension, and they were building the rectory at that time. So the owner of the Seven Gables here was gracious enough to offer them to stay here while they were building the rectory. So they were here for eight to nine months. And uh, she never stopped talking about the House of Seven Gables. She just loved it. The thing that uh, really I can remember that she was talking about when she was 16 about the, the breeze, with the cross breeze. Of course, the house was sitting on the bluff on Clearwater Bay, right a block from the courthouse, right on the water. And she would talk about sitting on these uh, the balconies up here or in her room with the, no air conditioning, of course, in those days. And it was just beautiful at night with the breeze blowing through that really was, she just loved that part of it. And she just, uh, the, the the, the building here itself, it just, she's just fascinated by it. And people notice it when they come here, it's a house you've got to see, it's just one of a kind. And it uh, brings back fond memories for me hearing her talk about it and walking here and see her bedroom where she stayed and the way she described it. In 1976, the house was moved by water and by road to where it now stands tall among the pines at Heritage Village. I was born here in Clearwater, I was born here in 1930, been here all my life, and it's so nice to walk out here and see what I remember as a child, these houses and homes out here that I remember back as a child that will be here that my kids and my great grandkids will remember and see, and it, it, I think it's a wonderful thing. Just, it, I, I just can't describe how it makes you feel being an old Florida cracker and coming out here and seeing these old homes like this compared to what Clearwater and Pines County looks like today. I'm sorry now that I didn't ask her more questions. You know, you always have that later on. You wish you'd ask them more about it, but uh, with the few stories I did get from her, I, I enjoyed, and it brings back some fond memories. School children love field trips to Heritage Village. Sometimes they imagine themselves to be pioneer kids. They'll try their hand at playing pioneer games or some of the planned activities offered by the village staff. A visit here to the Harris School is a must for these school groups. They like to sit in the small chairs and imagine learning their lessons from notes written on these old chalkboards like the one behind me. The Harris School is one of two one-room schoolhouses at Heritage Village. The other is Union Academy, one of Pinellas County's African-American schools from a bygone era. The lessons taught at Union Academy had a long-lasting effect on its students and made for long-lasting memories for the lady who sat at the teacher's desk. Union Academy, on display at Pinellas County's Heritage Village, was originally thought to have been built by the U.S. Army as a multi-purpose structure used as military barracks, an office, or warehouse. By 1926, it became a portable classroom at Tarpon Springs Elementary. Then, two of these buildings were moved to the all-African-American Union Academy in Tarpon Springs. At the Country Jubilee celebration at Heritage Village, we spoke with Ms. Alicia Roberts, who remembered Union Academy both as a student and as a teacher. It hasn't changed that much. It's the same building, same blackboards, same desks. <laughs> it's, uh, 
just bring back memories. Alicia chose education as her career at an early age while sitting in this very room. My mother taught in here too. My mother, she's the one that said that uh, I had to become a teacher because she was one. She said, you'll make a good teacher because I'm going to show you how it's done and you'll do it well. And when I would come home from college, I would go and sit in the classroom all day and watch her from morning until school was out. And I watched what she was doing. I watched how she did it. And I was taking everything in because I knew that it wouldn't be long before I graduated. After I had finished college and I came back, then I started working in this little one-room school. It's a little one room, but I, I liked it, I liked it. Alicia's career as an educator spanned 43 years, teaching mostly first and second graders. She says the little ones were often wise beyond their years and helped her through some difficult times as change rocked America. I stayed at Union Academy until 1969 and I was assigned to Sunset Hills on the other side of town, integration. But those first grade children took me through that. They were so precious. I couldn't have made it if, if it hadn't been for the first graders. They were so indifferent. They didn't know whether I was black or white. Because I asked the little boy one day, am I black or am I white? He said, I don't know. I don't know. So I asked the little girl. I said, am I a black lady or white lady? I don't know. <laughs> Union Academy offered a no-frills education with few embellishments, math, reading, writing, and home economics. Alicia has stayed in touch with some of her students who grew up to do her proud. So I saw one the other day who's a pharmacist at Walgreens. I said, oh boy, <laughs> I see them occasionally. They are, they are doing so many wonderful things now. As she sat in the small desk at Union Academy at Heritage Village, Alicia thought back through all of the history and smiled. It makes me feel good. I feel like I've accomplished something in life. I've done something well. To the early Pinellas County pioneers, big families had an advantage. The bigger the family, the easier it was to survive because you had the many hands it took to do all the many, many routine tasks that were so necessary in carving out a living in what was a very primitive environment by today's standards. Houses like this one, the Daniel McMullen House here at Heritage Village, were gathering places for those large families. Often they were expanded to accommodate a family's growth. There were always people here, always something cooking on the stove or baking in the oven. Always a friendly smile or hearty laugh. A house full of memories to connect the generations. Pinellas County in the 19th century was a much different place than it is today. During the time of the Civil War, only about 50 families lived in the area, even fewer after war's end. Among these early residents, the McMullen clan and the seven McMullen brothers who have left their mark on Pinellas County history. Here at Heritage Village, Pinellas County's Living History Museum, stands the home of Daniel McMullen and his wife Margaret Campbell McMullen, built in 1868. It originally stood along Rosary Road in Clearwater between Lake and Highland Avenues. When Heritage Village celebrated its 30th birthday during the annual Country Jubilee, one of the most notable parts of the celebration included lineal descendants of Daniel McMullen giving tours and telling stories about this historic structure. We talked with Daniel McMullen's great-granddaughter, Dottie McMullen Bouchard, who recalled frequently visiting the house while growing up, spending time with her favorite Aunt Nanny. Take a good picture of this loom now. Aunt Nanny was the person that I remember here most of the time. She was Daniel's daughter. And um, she sat near this fireplace and did her quilt piecing. She loved to make quilts. That was her, her favorite hobby. And uh, she had a big feather bed right here where the loom is. And she would sit in a little, little chair right where this lovely lady is sitting. And she would sew her little 
quilt scraps together. She had a basket much smaller than that one <laughs> with her scissors and her needle and, and her favorite quilts were the diamond shaped Western Star with all the little diamond shaped pieces. And there was in the winter there was always a fire in the fireplace there. Other bedrooms in the McMullen house took care of a family that continued to grow through the years. This was a bedroom when, no, uh, I think this was built on when she took in the second family. Because when I was a, a girl, this was, these two rooms belonged to my aunts, Pat and Nancy. There was a bed here and a cute little dressing table over there, right where the desk is. But it had a little frilly thing around it, you know, a little curtain around it. Given Aunt Nanny's penchant for quilting, it's no surprise that the McMullen House now at Heritage Village is home to the Largo Cracker Quilters. According to Dottie McMullen, things haven't changed much in more than a hundred years. Now this was where the quilt frame usually sat and um, it was right in the middle of the floor and all of the mothers would come over and after Aunt Nanny had pieced all these tiny little pieces together and um, then she'd set the quilting frame up and all the, the family ladies would come and the kids would play under the quilting frame. And that was just always a real special memory to me. Now the quilt frame is set up in another room of the house. One Dottie remembers as the dining room where all the adults gathered for a meal. But when I was a kid there was an enormous table in here that you could set 10, 12, 14 people around. And uh, very often <laughs> there were that many or more. What was on the dinner menu for a family back in those days? Only what you could grow or barter or catch with your own two hands. They really had to raise their own food and they ate a lot of mullet and grits. <laughs> they all raised corn and uh, there was a, a, a mill where you could take your corn to have it ground. And um, they, they raised a lot of cabbage and um, greens collard greens, turnip greens, mustard greens, but you know we hardly had a meal without greens and Aunt Nanny did a lot of canning and preserving and um, she made a lot of guava jelly. There were two big guava trees right near and she made guava jelly, guava preserves and um, I don't know, I can't remember what they were called, they were just kind of stewed guavas <laughs> and uh, had lots of homemade ice cream and everybody had a peach tree so we had homemade peach ice cream. Usually on my dad's birthday, we'd all get together and have homemade ice cream. Where was all this food prepared? Here in the McMullen kitchen, a very modest facility by today's standards. The wood stove was here and there's a hole in the ceiling, but um, I think this may have been the original house and maybe they added on or something because uh, I remember the stove pipe going out this wall but it was a wood stove and um, there were a lot of a lot of biscuits and cornbread made in those ovens Dottie McMullen remembers her aunt nanny with great fondness but she remembers her aunt's cooking with special delight I don't ever remember coming here when there wasn't a, a cake or a pie or two or three you know there was always dessert and uh, fried chicken Oh, you know, just tons of fried chicken because Aunt Nanny raised fried chicken. I mean, she didn't raise them fried. <laughs> hey, that's that's a trick, isn't it? She knew how to do it. <laughs> she she knew how to do that. But we just had tons of of chicken. The McMullen House, a living tribute to Pinellas County history and a hidden treasure worth rediscovering by your family. After having had so many people living in this old house for so long. Cleaning it out and getting it ready for its big move to Heritage Village in 1992 was a big task. Descendants were moving furniture and cleaning out closets and reliving memories. But some of the memories associated with this house are ours now, donated to Heritage Village to be shared with present and future generations of Pinellas County residents and visitors. Here's the story of how dozens of McMullen family letters have come to be a part of the history of Pinellas County. Built in 1868, the Daniel McMullen House has the distinction of being the longest continually lived in home in Pinellas County, as it was occupied by the McMullen family for 125 years. A lot of history occurred during those years. 
In a trunk stored in that home was a treasure. Letters. McMullen family letters going back to the 1850s. An entire family history preserved by McMullen descendant Peggy Miller and recently presented to the Board of County Commissioners to be placed in the historical archives of Heritage Village. All of these letters were, had been stored for many, many years in a closet and um, they took them out and of course couldn't throw them away, you know, when they began to, to read them and so they moved them to, up to eventually to Jay, Florida, where Peggy lives. And Peggy is now um, kind of downsizing and thought um, she would like for the letters to go with the house. Hundreds of letters, providing a rare and honest glimpse of a lifestyle that existed more than 100 years ago. The insights, information, and sensitivities revealed through these letters may yield a new interpretation and understanding, not only of one pioneer family, but for the early Pinellas community as a whole. It's not just about the McMullen family, although certainly that's what the details of the letter will reveal, but it's also about the community. It's about a perspective of a time and place, and so that's what we're really hoping to see. What was, you know, what was the religious fabric of the community? What were the social values and mores of the time? How did they look on what was happening in the nation and um, the state? What, what was really going through the minds of these people? There's no middle person to really interpret. These are the words of the people who wrote the letters. Writing letters for these pioneers was an art form, a reason to while away an afternoon on the porch swing with a box of stationery close by. Uh, it was something to do when, when it was uh, too hot to hoe in the garden, I think. <laughs> a way to get out of hoeing in the garden, perhaps. And, um, just a way to kind of sit on the porch and, and get by, to be by yourself. I think there was very little private time, don't you imagine? Not probably, yeah. When somebody wasn't looking over your shoulder, and I think that gave them a chance. Well, there are a lot of kids and people and Sunday dinners and. Oh, there were just always. Oh, there was always yeah. somebody here. Loads of people here. Yeah, loads of people. Always. And writing a letter was just a way to relax and unwind. Probably a bit of meditation, like to to kind of go through what you'd been through the day. My dear old friend, you ought to have been here Monday for the grand barbecue. It was held in an oak grove in front of our place. About 10, the express wagon with six beautiful horses to it, each one with a flag on its head and the brass van was in the wagon, came first. Just back of that was a carriage with the speakers in it. And back of that was a horseback parade of about 200 men and boys, each with a red scarf on. You never heard such cheers. But law, honey, the dinner was what took my eye. There were four tables about 60 feet long, and they were all covered, didn't even have room for a cloth, but were strewn from one end to the other with barbecued meat and baker's bread. I tell you, child, the cakes and pies were as scarce on that table as gold mines in Florida and were gone before you could wink. But I must not be too hard on the dinner. For you know, Monday is a bad day for picnics. I haven't read all the letters, and I understand some of them are pretty emotional and, um, and very political. And, and some uh, are pretty risque, too. Yeah, a little risque. <laughs> well, Aunt Nanny was, was um, she spoke her mind. Oh, they were <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yet, yet, we yeah. couldn't say shoot in front of her. No, no. That was like a curse word, I think. Mm -hmm. you know? Or darn, we couldn't say no, darn. No, couldn't say darn. Mm -hmm. Couldn't say shoot even. Oh shoot, couldn't say that. So, every one of the girls down there are getting tired of the single life, are they? We heard that five of them were to marry soon. Yes, and that you would enter the married circle this winter too. And make one of those boys think he had just stepped inside the gates of paradise. The girls up here are nice and pleasant. But it doesn't give me real pleasure to be in their company. Ah, uh, old friends and acquaintances are the ones you find genuine pleasure with. Letters written were labored on for hours. Letters received were read and reread. Those simple pages offered a brief respite from what was a day-to-day -day struggle to get by. Oh, it was very hard, very hard. We didn't know it, though. No, we didn't know it. We didn't know it. We, ha we had pl plenty of black-eyed peas and, and 
chicken, fried chicken, and corn on the cob, and tomatoes. And always cornbread. Tomatoes. Cornbread and biscuits, all at the same meal. We, were, we didn't know we were poor. <laughs> no, we didn't. We thought we were eating this because it was good. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't know it was what the poor people ate. <laughs> Letters that are 100 years old need special treatment to make sure they last for generations yet to come. The McMullen letters are now in good hands in the care of Heritage Village archivists. It came down to um, Peggy felt like Heritage Village would take care of them and that they had people here who knew how to keep them from falling apart because a lot of them were pretty brittle and Peggy was ready to um, um, you know, she needed to do something with them because we're all getting old. Absolutely. You know. Speak for yourself. <laughs> well, the first thing we want to do is stabilize the documents, and that consists of putting them in mylar packets, which will help to protect the paper and help with the brittleness and help keep everything intact and safe. The condition of the documents are actually very good. Um, considering how old they are, so far the ones that we have, I have unfolded and preserved and put in protective sleeves have been in really, really excellent condition. The aim of the staff of Heritage Village is to preserve the original documents while making their content available to historians and the general public. Hundreds of documents will represent hours of intensive work over the next several months before the project is complete. We make a digital image of the document to preserve it. That way the person who is doing the transcribing can actually have a hard copy, a facsimile if you will, an exact document that is exactly the same um, as the original and then we do contrasting to make the ink a little darker so they'll be able to see the words and then they type in the words to the computer so we have a, a transcription so it's easier to read and that history is in there for preserved in a way that's easier for us to read. Soon, the personal letters of the McMullen pioneers will be a part of the history of Pinellas County, with stories shared for years to come. My dear son, as your mother has commenced to write, I can't write much. My hand is so trembly that I can hardly hold the pen to form letters. I've just come from sowing oats and rye. I've sowed the back of the garden where I have corn this year. Mr. William Roberts is brushing it with Crockett. It makes the ground look very pretty. Crockett looks very well. I haul my cotton to the gin. I guess I will have two good bags. It will be ginned by tomorrow night and I will ship it next week to Savannah. My corn in the flat is as good as I ever had it, but it is blown down badly. My potatoes is large enough, but they have burst the worst kind. My rice is just now ready for cutting. I shall cut it next week. Then I shall go to the point and look after our cows. I did uh, come over here to this house uh, when Peggy and Nancy were packing things up. And the, the things that I remember uh, the most were Margaret Ann's little notes that she had made. And um, it was, I think it was at the time when Pinellas and Hillsboro were separating. That was kind of the feeling I got. And uh, not being a historian, I couldn't swear by that. But um, she was just fussing about the people who were in office, you know. I heard a little slogan on one of these little notes was, throw the scoundrels out. <laughs> I don't know who the scoundrels were. <laughs> they are amazing stories, one and all. The tales, the letters, the buildings, the artifacts. They are a link to our past here in Pinellas County, presenting a picture of how different and yet how very similar life was way back then. Take a stroll into the past yourself soon. The memories are all right in front of you to help you create some new memories all your own. History lives right here at Pinellas County's Heritage Village. For Pinellas County Connection Television, I'm Len Sazinski.